um, click the record button. So again, your cameras and audio are turned to off, but we'll just be recording this. Um, and I would like to as well, just see if we can Facebook Live it because that's a really nice way to save it for um, anybody who missed it. So um, just give me one second to pull that Yeah, up. and then we will be sharing the link to the recording afterwards. It takes yeah. a little bit to process, but we'll be sending that out as well. Yeah, and y'all will get, um, I try to do a PDF of the slides. So, uh, you know, taking notes is great because um, you can have them later and it helps you kind of remember everything. But if you, you know, if you don't, that's quite all right. You know, you can definitely do that later. So, okay, let me add a title here. All right, so um, to get started, my name's Tina McIntyre and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent at the University of Florida IFAS Extension. We have extensions in all 67 counties and I am in Seminole County. We're also joined by Ms. Tiare Silvasi and she's in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent for Orange County. And um, today we're gonna talk all about how you can create habitat in your landscape. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna cover why Florida wildlife is interesting, unique, and cool. We're gonna talk about Florida wildlife and if it's threatened. We're gonna cover um, things that you can do to work with Florida wildlife in your yard. And then we're also gonna talk about nuisance wildlife and kind of thinking about um, you know, reinventing and diving a little deeper into that side. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Program is brought to you by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the University of, of Florida. And it is actually in Florida law. And the goal of this program is to actually protect our resources. So protect our water, um, conserve our resources, conserve water, reduce waste and pollution, prevent erosion, which also further degrades our waterways. And it does this by using the nine Florida friendly principles. So again, in 20, 2009, it was actually passed in the Florida legislature saying this is the Florida law. And so that's why Tia and I are here to bring this information to you. One of the Florida friendly principles is to actually create habitat and attract wildlife. So this is what this class is all about. And so in Florida, we're extremely unique uh, because South Florida, we have our tropical systems. Central Florida, we're subtropical and have a even more variety of systems. We have our coasts. And then of course in North Florida, we're a little bit more temperate. Um, so we have um, a lot of diversity throughout the state, including 2,850 native plant species, 700 native vertebrates. So that's going to be your birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. We have 15,000 native invertebrates. So those are insects. And you might say, well, I really don't like bugs. Um, but bugs and insects and invertebrates are the foundation of our ecosystem and that food web um, of life that we, that we understand and that we exist in. Um, endemic species are species that are only found in Florida. So they can't be found anywhere else on the planet. That means it's endemic. Well, we have 224 endemic plant species, 14 endemic vertebrates. So again, your things with a spine, things with a backbone, uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And then we have 1,500 endemic invertebrates. And a lot of invertebrates are still left to be find, found here in Florida. So we do have species that are still getting discovered in our state, which is kind of amazing because we think everything's kind of cataloged and put in a, you know, a laboratory and in a book, but we're still discovering species in our state, some of which um, you know, might be invasive species, some of which are native species, usually in the insect population. 
Of course, this abundance of wildlife brings us ecological services. This could include pollination, which is beneficial to agriculture and a lot of our garden crops and things like that. Um, so these insects actually pollinating our plants. Pest control, of course, we have, you know, this owl here is kind of fostering the web of life and, you know, eating the rodents and various things within our uh, cities and our urban areas. And then of course, recreation, you know, during this last year of the pandemic, we have, I think as a society really embraced um, being outside and, you know, the benefits that it provides, not only of course, you know, in a pandemic, but also just mentally and that, you know, recreating, being in nature uh, really does help our health and our mental health. So there was a United Nations report that came out um, not too long ago, so May 2019, and this was an intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. So basically a lot of really smart scientists got together um, from various governments around the world, and they assessed the state of biodiversity. So that's the number of species that we have on the planet and um, the ecosystem services that were provided to the society in response to, to requests from decision makers. And this report found that 75% of the land environment and some 66% of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human actions. That's quite a lot. So when we're talking about the entire biome, the entire planet, 75% of the land is is basically altered. Um, more than one third of the world's land surface and nearly 75% of freshwater resources are used for crops and livestock and up to 577 billion in annual glo glo global crops are at risk from pollinator loss. So they kind of, you know, really dove into these ecosystem services and said, you know, what would happen if this disappears? What is the economic value of this? And what is our real reliance on these services? Um, and obviously, you know, in the top right, we can see it's quite significant. We do rely heavily on this for our survival. Since 1992, the world's urban areas have more than doubled. And they concluded that biodiversity and nature's contributions to people are our common heritage and humanity's most important life supporting safety net. Um, our safety net is stretched almost to the breaking point. So she was kind of the Miss Sandra Diaz of Argentina was kind of the spokesperson for this report. And so, you know, there really is a fair amount of habitat loss that this habitat that is naturally occurring throughout our state and throughout the planet is rapidly being depleted. So in Florida alone, we see 7 million acres being projected to be lost by 2060. When we say lost, we mean, you know, the trees are actually removed and we're putting in concrete for homes and stores and things like that. There's also a population growth um, to be the third highest population in the United States. As most of you know, you know, Florida is rapidly growing. A thousand new people move to Florida a day. So here's some projections from the University of Florida, Thousand Friends of Florida and Florida Department of Agriculture. They all got together and created what's called the Florida 2070 plan. You can see data from 2010 on the left. This is 18 million um, kind of projected going up to 21 million. So we have in red the developed um, parcels of land. So that's basically urbanized concrete paved land. And then the green is reflecting protected land. When we uh, forecast out to the 2070, um, so looking several decades into the future, you can see that a lot of this land does get urbanized and gets um, converted. Um, so looking down here at the bottom, we can see that 19% um, in 2010 was developed, projecting out that almost doubles to 34% um, by 
um, when we look at the protected environment, we're not seeing a large increase. And so we're still protecting our Everglades going out into the future. Um, and, you know, other areas throughout maybe the Panhandle or the Ocala National Forest there up north. Um, and we do see actually a decrease in agriculture. So decreasing from 22% to 16%, which does make sense as we look around Central Florida, we see a lot of conversion of our old agriculture, um, orange fields and things like that being converted to development. And then this other, you know, could be maybe commercial or industry or who knows, you know, kind of variables. Uh, but we do see, again, an almost um, doubling of our developed area. And again, this is really what our matrix, our average matrix is looking like. So, um, you know, this is actually just around where our office is um, in Seminole County. But honestly, it looks like anywhere Florida, right? We have a lot of roads. We have an airport. We have um, some patches of green space. And this is really interesting from a conservation biology perspective because what we really look for is contiguous land. So we want to see that these animals are able to, and plants, are able to disperse themselves among the matrix, what we call the matrix we're looking at, not the movie. So, um, but basically, you know, so this parcel of land here that I have my mouse over, you know, there might be some connectivity to other parcels, but there's a lot of, you know, maybe roads or homes or pavement in the way. And so it's very difficult for these animals and plants to disperse and move throughout to finish their life cycles of procreating, um, you know, raising their young, eating, foraging. And this is really um, what we call fragmentation. And fragmentation can be difficult for animals, not only for dispersal, but because it puts them in contact with automobile collisions. Um, it creates more what we call edge habitat. And so when we have a fragmented parcel, the habitat on the edge of that parcel is not as quality as the rest of it, um, just because we get invasive species around the edge. We might get a lot of weediness, um, a lot of density, and then that habitat in the middle tends to be a little bit more quality. So we have edge habitat, edge effects, and then of course more human interaction. So you know, I'll talk a lot more about bears, but Seminole County, we have a bear ordinance area where we do have a high volume of bears in our Wakaiva Basin area. Um, and again, you know, where Tia's at, Orange County, we do see them out east and throughout Central Florida, um, highly populated in the Ocala National Forest as well. But, you know, we don't want these human wildlife interactions that can result in negative occurrences for not only the human, but for the animal. You know, a lot of the times if there is some type of attack, the animal does um, perish. And so we want to reduce those conflicts so that there's the humans and the animals are more safe. So looking at how many acres of habitat is lost, you know, just to kind of connect it to those individual species, when we look at bald eagle habitat and many, many birds of prey, they do need a lot of space. And so um, 1.9 million acres of bald eagle habitat has been decreased. 2.3 million acres of black bear habitat. And again, they need a lot of habitat. And so that kind of goes into this equation our Florida burrowing owl, which is a really, you know, kind of interesting thing. Um, you know, we usually think of owls in the trees, but this is a very unique Florida species. They're, they've lost, uh, well, this is projected through 2060 to have lost 200,000 acres and our Florida panther, 300,000 and so on and so on. So you can see it is quite significant um, you know, looking at their turkeys, wild turkeys, 2.1 million acres, you know, as we transition that green space into red urbanized space in the 2070 plan, um, these are the homes of where these animals live. We do have other threats, so climate change, sea level rise, um, weather events, of course, hurricanes, we're all familiar with those, um, rain patterns, and again, threats to our dispersal. We have invasive species, um, 
So looking at, you know, the Florida Python, and here we have a uh, soda apple, which is an invasive plant. So we can have, you know, poisonous plants like this soda apple. We can have, um, this is a non-venomous snake, snake, but it does consume a significant amount of our small mammal species throughout South and Central Florida. Um, the data has showed that I think it was in the 90 something percent that they've actually decreased the amount of animals, of small mammals because of these pythons. So um, kind of looking at endangered species and how our urbanization has also kind of imperiled these species. We have a total of 131 imperiled species and this is recent data from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, our state agency that works to protect these animals. And you can see kind of listed here, we have those um, six amphibians, 35 birds, 14 species of fish, 21 invertebrate species. Uh, so again, that's your insects and such. Uh, 32 mammal species, which is quite significant for our mammals. And then 23 reptile species. And so, you know, I kind of, have to give you that doom and gloom overview because it really shows us how critically important our little habitat that we have in our home is. So you might say, you know, my yard's not that big. I can't support a, you know, a panther habitat. Of course, yes, but the land that we do have collectively really does add up. So when we think about not only our yards, but our communal HOA spaces, our stormwater ponds, you know, these are great areas for us to encourage, um, you know, even small insects and small birds and butterflies and things like that. Um, and thinking about where your surrounding environment is, you know, are you close to a stormwater pond? That could be a nice little area of connectivity. Um, you know, what habitat features and habitat uh, does your yard already provide, you know, and so thinking about your yard in the context of the bigger connectivity of these animals. Yeah, so let me hear a little bit about the ecosystems we have here in Central Florida. Like Tina was saying, you really have to observe your surroundings and see what's existing, and that will help you to select the right species for your yard. If you've ever taken one of our Florida friendly landscaping classes, you'll know that our first principle is right plant, right place. And observing some of the natural habitat around you will help you make these selections. What I'm gonna do now is just go through a couple of the ecosystems in Florida. Um, we're just gonna mention a couple and the plants and the animals that live in these ecosystems, such as the scrub, the flatwoods, the sand hills, the hardwood hammocks, and the freshwater mulch, mulch, marsh, I mean. But there are over 80 distinct ecosystems in Florida. So we're just going to mention a few to give you an idea. And just to let you know, Tia, you should be able to click. Oh. I didn't know that. Mm. No, it doesn't work. Thank you. All right, so like I was saying, the right plant in the right place, what we're looking for in these Central Florida ecosystems is how do they, what are the growing conditions? You know, what are the native plants that grow there and the wildlife adapted to live in them? And then you can try to mimic this in your own backyard. So we're looking at different, um, site components such as sun or shade, what is the sunlight in your area? The soil pH, it plays a big determining factor because it will, that's something that's harder to change that will affect how your plants are growing. Also, what type of soil do you have? Is it sandy? Is it clay? Um, is it wet or dry? You know, if you naturally live kind of in a river basin, you might have very wet, um, you know, high organic matter soil. Whereas if you're one of the higher drier spots of the state, it might be very dry. You'll need to select heat tolerant and drought tolerant plants. 
So let me first talk about scrub and you can see the little blue scrub jay there and you'll see these around uh, Ocala National Forest. There are some in Titusville and these scrub are high elevation on remnant sand dunes back from when Florida was mostly underwater. They're mostly located in the central kind of rib of the state, like think about Lake Wales area. And it's dense but patchy shrub, so very low growing, usually a good ground cover. Um, you'll see some smaller oaks like scrub oaks. And it's very dry because of the sandy soils and the higher elevation, which gives it the good drainage. So some of the wildlife you'll see in this area include the sand skink, and those are really pretty. Also the scrub jay pictured here and the gopher tortoise. Okay, now I figured it out. Um, the next community is the Sand Hill. And this is one of my favorite. I just love the look of it. Um, here the soils are well drained. It's dry and low in nutrients. You often find this with uh, longleaf pines as the overstory canopy of the longleaf pines and some turkey oaks. And then it might have an understory of some um, salt palmettos, some wire grass, some butterfly pea, some gopher, gopher apple. And it has this open canopy because it's a fire dependent ecosystem. It is natural for um, these areas to catch on fire. It used to be by lightning, these areas would burn every couple years. Now we do more prescribed burns to do the burning in a more controlled way. And the wildlife you'll find in areas like this include the fox squirrel, the gopher tortoise, the fence lizard, and the blue-tailed skink, which is a really cool little skink. Yeah, if anybody has a chance to see the recently burned sand hill, it's quite amazing. And a few months after a burn, you just see so many amazing wildflowers coming up and the species diversity really increases. Yeah, it just starts all fresh and green. It's beautiful. And then we have the pine flatwoods, which is very level in topography and not much um, contour there. And this can have wet conditions. Oh, no, no, I skipped a slide. There we go, the pine flatwoods. Um, it, it doesn't drain that well. So it can be wet during rainy season, like in the summertime. And this is characterized by deep soil, acidic, like low pH conditions, and poorly drained, coarse textured soil. In this kind of ecosystem, you'll find the slash pine, uh, salt pal palmetto, and wax myrtle. And so those are all more uh, water loving plants. Um, salt palmetto can actually take very a uh, lot of water in extremely dry conditions. So it's one of those bulletproof Florida native plants that can take both extremes. And some of the animals and wildlife you'll find in these areas include the gray fox, the white tailed deer, and Bachman sparrow, and also the cricket frog. Oh. All right, the last one I'm going to talk about is the hardwood hammocks. And so this is what you think of when you're going for a nice nature hike, the beautiful oaks, you know, canopy over your head, nice and shady. And so these can be wet or dry hammocks. And hammocks is just another word for like a forest. Um, and this soil has higher nutrients and more organic matter. Um, due to all the vegetation and the shade tolerant hardwoods with few pines. So not so many pines, but more oaks and uh, sweet gums, maybe maple trees in these kind of areas. And the type of wildlife you'll find are the gray squirrel and wild turkeys and Carolina wren and also deer are quite common in areas like this. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tina, for the next slide. 
Excellent. Yeah, I love the hardwood hammocks. And sometimes you can see a transition into what we call a palm hammock, where, you know, here on the left, um, you can see our sable palm, our state tree, um, you know, really starting to kind of transition. So you might see a transition from the oaks to the palms and so on. And so embracing these plants that are, again, native and, and used to being here in your backyard is really where it all starts. So we want to think about some aspects. So Thea threw out a, a lot of really good things to consider. pH is huge in Florida. Um, you know, we want to definitely start with that. But then, you know, thinking about landscape design, um, thinking about the wildlife itself and what their needs are, the current site condition. So again, that's, you know, soil, moisture, water, uh, sand and sun, the, all the different aspects of the site, and then selecting some realistic plant choices. So a really just easy peasy one here is our Florida native wild coffee. This does well in full sun or full shade. Um, it can be trimmed back or actually grown up into a small shrub. It has beautiful little nectar flowers that are great for our pollinators. And then it also is followed by these red berries, which are great for wildlife. So a really good one for under your oak tree. You know, we have a lot of areas that are full shade and it's like, what do I put? This is a great candidate. Thinking about your site conditions again. So when you think about your landscape, you know, you want to think about start with the roof of your house. Um, where does the water first when it rains come off of your roof and where are your gutters? Where are those gutters pointed? Um, are they directed towards the street? That is not really what we recommend for Florida Friendly. We want to utilize that rainwater um, into, say, maybe a rain garden or disperse throughout our turf so that we can um, capture that water and utilize it. We want to think about how the sun moves through the, over the house. So is it, you know, is it South facing house, north facing entrance? Um, is it a high sun area? Do you have any large shade trees? Thinking about all the different aspects of that property and what it's close in proximity to. So even if there's, you know, a fence or maybe you have some neighbors, maybe you don't, maybe you have a conservation area close by. So just kind of doing a little sketch. Actually, when we do our landscape design class, it's a lot of fun. We get out some graph paper. We have to start with our home surveys and then we you know, just kind of doodle around and think about ways to increase that habitat. Another important aspect is the cold hardiness. So the USDA Department of Agriculture has these cold hardiness zone maps. So for Seminole County, we are in zone 9B, but Florida, we range from um, you know, zone eight through 11. So eight is up here in the north, 11's down here in the south, and it's very different. So when you go from 8 to 11, there's a quite different uh, palette of plants that you can select. So be sure that you know your cold hardiness zone. And if you're selecting a tree species, I actually recommend taking a look at the NOAA, N-O-A-A, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's um, cold hardiness map as well, because these USDA maps don't take into account climate change. And so NOAA does. And so if we're planting a tree that's going to be 50 years old, um, especially if it's a fruit bearing tree or something like that, we want to take that into consideration because I know for Seminole County, we do have some anticipated zone changes um, as climate does change in the future. Considering sunlight. So full sun, we actually look at six hours or more. So when we say full sun, that's what we mean. Direct, full sunlight, six hours or more. Part sun or part shade, however you like to say it. Um, they're interchangeable, but it means three to six hours of sun each day, um, preferably in the morning or early afternoon. So um, that's kind of what we mean there. And then full shade is less than three hours of direct sunlight. So um, we have deep shade, which really doesn't get any sunlight at all. Um, dappled shade can add up, but just, you know, really watch the area to kind of try to calculate it. 
Um, thinking about pH, so diving a little bit into this um, little chemistry lesson here, our pH ranges that we typically see for plants run, and in Florida, it can actually run from four to about you know eight or nine. And so the, the pH um, scale runs from zero to 14, with zero being the most acidic um, and 14 being the most alkaline. Usually our plants, uh, soils is gonna be somewhere between you know, five and eight here we can see on the spectrum, but this pH actually will limit or benefit the absorption of nutrients. And so we look at our nutrients here, our nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or NPK found on our fertilizer bags, um, it's going to be absorbable at some pHs and not absorbable at others. So if we have, if we're growing fertilizer at our landscape or, you know, trying to plant a species that um, thrives in one pH and doesn't in another, just really important to understand that pH so that we can be sure that that plant is adequately absorbing these nutrients. Uh, for soil type, in Florida, we're mostly gonna be some kind of variation of sandy. Sandy loam, sandy clay, sandy sand, sand, you know, most of us are sand. Um, and so just kind of understanding if you do have a little layer of topsoil and what that might look like in your yard. The pH, if it's acidic, neutral, or alkaline, we've talked a lot about that. Um, the percolation, so how quickly does it drain? You know, like Tia was saying, for our various ecosystems, some of the ecosystems, like a sandhill, the water's going to percolate very quickly in a sandhill, and it's just going to really flush right into the aquifer. In um, others, it's going to stand around. So like those palm hammocks, we're going to have a lot of, you know, kind of standing around of water. And so what type of site do you have? For new development, there could be a lot of compaction or maybe even fill materials. And if you have new um, development, I definitely recommend a pH test because we have seen some really crazy eight, nine pH levels with the soil testing on the new um, fill dirt areas. So no matter what your soil is, the texture, pH, whatever, we all benefit from enhancing that organic material. And we do that by using manure, compost, grass clippings, food waste, et cetera. Tia and I have a lot of really great um, tips and tricks and um, you know, even a recent EDIS publication on organic material and composting, worm composting, cover crop, plant manure. So that's your green manures that you can kind of grow uh, legume or, or bean plants to compost them to enhance that nitrogen in your soil. And mulch, mulch is great at bringing that organic material into your soil. So, um, you know, thinking about ways to, despite where, you know, what kind of soil you have, enrich that organic material and your plants will benefit. Again, mulch is fantastic. Um, you know, pretty soon there's going to be a lot of tree trimming for preparing in hurricane season. Those oak limbs are fantastic mulch. If your neighbor is cutting off a big limb of their oak tree and mulching it up, wave the, the, the people down and say, hey, can I have a, a couple yards for that? Um, you know, and, and a small pile will definitely benefit your landscape in the long run. You can use it on pathways, use it on your landscape beds. It's gonna hold that moisture at the root zone. Um, buffer soil temperature, suppress weeds, which we all need, and um, add small nutrients to the soil. Water requirements. So thinking about the requirements of the species we're selecting. So here you can see a nice Chickasaw plum uh, in full fruit. We want to think about, you know, it might need extra water while it's fruiting. Um, and we want to look for signs of wilting, signs of prolonged drought. So if you, you know, kind of look at your weather app and say, oh, geez, it hasn't rained in a while. You know, let me check my plants. Let me see if they're doing okay. Of course, our newly planted, if you're planting a landscape or you're out there in your spring garden, um, you know, definitely water every day. Make sure you're establishing those new plants. And um, again, during fruiting, we need to make sure that we're supplying that extra water that that species might need. 
So kind of transitioning here to think about our habitat needs. That's really what today is all about, right? We want to create habitat. We want to be able to provide for our, our animal friends. So when we think about creating habitat, this is a collection of resources required by each species of wildlife for survival. So it could change, depend on the species, but at the end of the day, all species are gonna need food, water, cover, and space. And really it's not necessarily habitat if one of those things are missing. Now they could be maybe get three from your yard and then the space can come collectively from your neighborhood or a conservation area nearby or you know something to kind of meet that checkbox. But if it's a fully urbanized area without a contiguous space, it might not be enough habitat, but it depends on the animal. So um, you know, a bear is going to need a lot more space than say, you know, that little waxling that we had on the left. Um, a wildlife landscape design. So, you know, we can still have a curated manicured landscape that looks nice, that's Florida friendly, but again, does provide habitat for our pollinators, our birds, our, you know, um, uh, amphibians and snakes and various animals. So you might say, well, how do I find these plants? Because you know, if you're looking to create habitat, going to the big box stores can be a little challenge, although they do offer some pollinator friendly plants. Um, you might need to do a little digging to find those native species which provide our natural heritage um, that wildlife are adapted to. So you have to think these wildlife have co-evolved over millennia with these plant species. And so um, that's kind of the benefit of seeking out these native plants. And then again, they're adapted to our environment so they can be a little less maintenance. When we look at plant selection resources and we can chat these, um, I think actually Tia, it looks like she's already on it. Thank you, Tia. Um, for plant selection, we have the floridanativenurseries.org. Um, they're really great if you go to the professionals tab and try to look for um, various um, you know, nurseries in the area. We have our Florida Friendly Plant Selection Guide, which is really good for helping to select what plants you want. FloridaYards.org, that's another good one to play around and um, select plants. And then again, for acquisition, we have the FNGLA.org and you can find all of their members which have unique and lovely species. And then a little known one is Plant Ant. It's just spelled like a plant and then an ant.com. And this one is going to help you, again, find specific species or nurseries that will help you um, cultivate that habitat. And I will turn it over to Tia. All right, great. So continuing on the theme of how to attract wildlife into your landscape, I'm going to be talking about some of the plants that are good to plant in your yard and just giving examples, but remember you will need to select plants that are suitable for your site. If you have sun or shade or wet or dry or depending on uh, what the pH is. Um, so some of the things that we're gonna talk about, um, berries for birds, just habitat, like space. It doesn't matter what type of plants you have, just providing that shelter for the animals to live in. Also the layering um, for different levels for providing shelter and habitat. And then specific pl plants for butterfly, like butterfly host plants. So let's see if I can get the slide thing to work again here. If not, I'm happy to do it, Tia. Okay, I was having trouble with that. Um, so pictured here is the Gallardia, and this is a native flower with the red center and the yellow tips. And this is great for bees and butterflies. The bright flower color attracts those in, and it's a native plant. This is the blanket flower. The name is in the, the bottom right there. You'll see this naturally along the sand dunes in the beach. Like when I go to Cocoa Beach, I'll see this in the dunes. And this is a native species, although there's been some recent discussion questioning that, but 
we're going to keep it as a native species. And native species have a natural heritage value and they're uh, adapted to our region. And then there are specific insects that are adapted to these plants. So the insects co-evolved with the plants over the past you know, thousands of years. And so they're kind of like buddies, they're partners. They have maybe specific plant parts or insect mouth parts that are compatible. And so when you do plant native plants, then you can attract some unique pollinators that maybe you won't get, you know, just by planting zinnias or cosmos or marigolds or the normal ones. And so you can select these plants that are good and adapted to your environment and then there'll be also less maintenance. For example, a flower like this a blanket flower or gallardia, um, it doesn't need much water or fertilizer or pest control. You can basically leave it, get it established, you know, water it in and um, get it established for a couple of weeks and then it should be able to survive off of just rainfall in nature alone. So this next plant picture here is the fire bush. And someone was asking, what is a good plant for hummingbirds? Well, this is an excellent choice for hummingbirds. It is a native species. They also make a native um, cultivar of this, which we call a native var, which is a dwarf fire bush. Now, some people argue that the dwarf, when we make dwarf cultivars that are man-made, although it still is native, um, the flowers are a little bit smaller and the insects don't like it as much. Um, I haven't seen an official research article about that, but I have heard that from other people. So firebush is a great plant for shady areas. It can also grow in sun. It's uh, drought tolerant. I have one in my yard and the deer eat it a little bit, but as long as it grows above where the deer can reach it, um, that's great. And it's a very easy to grow um, native plant for hummingbirds and butterflies. So another thing you want to look for is plants that make berries like this beauty berry. It has these beautiful purple berries and it's not the bird's favorite food, but they will eat it. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. This beauty berry you'll see in some of the you know, more moist areas, acidic areas. It's pretty adaptable to many pHs. Um, we have this planted in our downtown Orlando garden right in the middle of the city and it does fine there too. And it will kind of go dormant in the winter so it will lose its leaves. And then in the spring, it will flush new leaves and it will have a beautiful display of flowers. And then each of those flowers will turn into a little purple berry, which you'll see in the late fall. It will be part of our fall color. Yeah, and this is this is a great one to try too. If you see it in nature, you know, just grab a little a little cutting, a little piece, and try to make a cutting out of it. I have a video on our Facebook page that shows people how to make cuttings with mulberries. Uh, but it's the same principle, you know, so if you can't find things or you're out on a hike, um, you know, we don't recommend digging anything up or anything like that and be sure you know what species it is, but cuttings of beauty berries can be a great way to get that started in your yard. Yeah, I tried to plant some from seed too. I'll see if they sprout. And of course, those are all available at the native plant nursery that I put the link in the chat. Um, so here's a uh, next slide on what food will your plants produce and who will eat it. So, you know, we want to, we know that we should grow fruits and berries, but, um, you know, you can get a little bit more technical with it. So for example, acorns, if you have an oak tree, you might hate those acorns, you know, dropping in the driveway, but you'll definitely find a lot of squirrels and the wild turkeys will come and eat them and also raccoons and deer. So those are a good treat for those type of animals. Um, hollies that get the bright red berries, those are a popular food for songbirds in general and cardinals love them. You'll see the mockingbird eating the holly berries. 
And these bright fruits are meant to attract wildlife. So um, when you find any kind of bright fruit, then that's a good choice. You know, you can just assume that any kind of fruit, bright fruits are good choice to plant in your landscape to attract wildlife. So this next slide is how will you attract a bird of prey? And so they don't really eat, you know, berries like the cardinal and stuff do, but they might prey on other creatures. Like you'll find them eating snakes or they'll be preying on some rats or mice. And so um, it's a good idea to just have the space and provide some habitat for the birds of prey. They like to perch, you know, really high up. So leave that dead tree, that dead snag in your yard for them to have a nice perch. You also see them on your power lines or on tall tree branches because they're looking down and, and looking for, um, you know, things that they can eat. And they're a great control for, you know, rats and mice, especially. Um, where, where I live, I don't have much of a problem at all with the rats and mice because I have a healthy a hawk and owl population in my backyard. I know, and it's amazing that a lot of our birds of prey can exist in urban areas because, well, there's a lot of dumpsters. And so, you know, that yeah. is supporting that, that food web. They've kind of adapted into urban areas in some ways. Yeah, and they like that little clearing too, so they can have a high perch and see that clearing and then eat all your rats and mice. So a couple other things you want to consider when you're selecting food to plant in your landscape for the wildlife is the seasonality. So what time of the year is the food produced? And you want to try to, you know, get something year round for the wildlife, for example, something in the spring, something in the fall, something all year, like the elderberries kind of flower and fruit and flower and fruit. And so just keep staggering this. And what I like to do is to go to the plant nursery a couple times a year, instead of just going one time and just buying everything, you know, go every quarter and then you can see what's flowering or what's fruiting at that time and get a nice plant selection that's uh, well-rounded for the whole season. So the next thing is the size of the food. So birds swallow food whole, so the size matters. Um, they can kind of bite and peck at other stuff, like sometimes they eat my papayas off the tree. And so just the fruit and the seed size can matter with some of the different plant species. Um, here we have the catbird pictured on the left eating a mulberry. So mulberries are a great um, choice because not only do they provide food for you, but they provide food for the birds. I, I find them to be very tasty and I have to go and, you know, try to beat the birds to them in the morning. And then pictured on the right is the pine warbler, which is a, a beautiful little yellow bird. And that's a little smaller. It likes a little bit smaller of plants and seeds. Yeah, anybody who's who's followed me for even a little bit probably knows how much I love mulberries, that they're just so fun and you can make all kinds of delicious food and then you really do get a lot of great birds in your yard, the, you know, all kinds of things love them. Yeah, all kinds of birds love them. That's right. Mulberries is a great choice. So um, next is the taste of the food. So if it tastes good to us, it will likely taste good to wildlife. So you'll hear about people complaining that, you know, their fruits, their blueberries are being eaten by birds and bears. And that's because they taste good. We know they like them. So you can plant a little bit for yourself, a little bit for the wildlife. And all food becomes more valuable with scarcity. So if there's not a lot of food, you'll see them, the wildlife going for the kind of less desirable bird, the food, you know, stuff that they might not go for at first, but as food becomes more scarce, then they'll eat things that they were kind of like, uh, oh, I'll eat that kind of last resort. And I noticed that um, in my yard with the deer too, like they'll just munch on some things that they usually don't eat, but they were just really hungry, I guess. Sounds like my, my kid. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so plant fertilization is something else that you should be aware of because um, not all plants are self-fertile. Some of them are monoecious, which is when the plant produces the male and the female flower parts. So it's all the parts on one plant, whereas other plants are dioecious. And that's when there are separate plants for male and female. And you will need both of them to produce the fruit. So some examples of this are the wax myrtle, um, the southern red cedar, the Florida privet, also some of the hollies. So if you're getting a holly tree or a holly shrub for the berries, go at the time that it's making the berries and make sure you select a female one to produce the fruit. Um, you can still have male plants and they will flower and pollinate and you know fertilize the females. But if you really want the berries, then you might have to do some selection for the females that are producing the fruit of certain species. So another source of food is the foliage. And in the top right hand corner, we have the monarch caterpillar that is chomping away at the milkweed leaf. So you'll see these caterpillars that are growing on the larval host plants um, for the butterflies. And so that's something else you have to be okay with is that the caterpillar will eat a lot of the leaves and then it will kind of leave your plant looking bare, but you should be happy that, you know, the caterpillar ate all of your plant and it's turning into a butterfly. So don't get upset. And sometimes if you see little holes in your plants, you know, before you go and want to spray, uh, of course, identify what it is that's eating it and determine and if that's good or bad. Um, other things that eat foliage are the deer and rabbits and gopher tortoises. And so you'll see them munching or you'll see the plant munched and wonder, oh, what ate this down to a nub? Well, it might have been some deer. And even in urban areas, I've seen big groups of deer, you know, flow through like normal lawns that people have. So they're out there. It's kind of amazing the caterpillar and the, you know, the plant have this dance of, you know, the caterpillar eats all the leaves, but leaves it so that it can still bloom after it does its, you know, um, gestation into an adult uh, butterfly, it can come back and still pollinate the plant. And they've kind of figured it out to where, you know, they're just able to, to coexist like that. Yeah, it's a cycle. So um, just wrapping up here with some of the food is the invertebrates. And so building a healthy and productive invertebrate food base will increase wildlife higher up the food chain. So we're like going from small to big, you know, the birds of prey are eating some smaller stuff. The invertebrates are the smaller, you know, not birds, but like bees and insects. And so um, some of the plants that are good for attracting these insects are the larval host plants, like for butterflies, um, native species in general provide good pollinator resources. Also using integrated pest management and identifying bugs and using different methods to control them because um, these insects can be part of a biological control and take care of some of your pests by eating them too. Um, flowers in general are good for providing nectar and pollen and also habitat like some rough bark like in pine trees you know that gives places for insects to go in and hide and reproduce and have shelter to complete their life cycle. And then the last thing we can mention is some like mulch or leaf litter. Like you don't wanna scrape your ground clean all the time, you know, have some mulch, have some leaf litter, maybe even a little pile of branches and that will give some more, you know, habitat and provide shelter for these invertebrates and insects to live. Awesome, thanks Tia.
And Tia is a wealth of knowledge. And so I'm just going to chat her Facebook page in the chat. Um, definitely follow her on Facebook and check out all her classes and everything because she is a wealth of knowledge on many aspects. Um, so diving into kind of plant arrangement, and Tia did mention it a little bit earlier, that we want to embrace not only a diversity of species, so thinking about, you know, what plants we're, we're selecting, we want to think about vertical layering and the depth. So you can see here, this is our demonstration landscape at the UF IFAS in Seminole. And we have some little ground covers. Um, we have some shrubs. We have obviously a tree. That's our um, Chickasaw plum tree. Um, it's harder to see on the left, but we do have some little shrubs and kind of um, small shrubs and things like that. So you want to think about um, using that. And then areas of high visibility, you can also use, you know, ground covers and things like that. So for cover and space, co um, excuse me, the it should correlate to the amount of water, of food and water. So we want to think about, you know, the amount of water that we're providing or that might be provided on a large scale and, um, you know, how much cover is also available. So basically how much water plus the amount of cover is going to equal um, the amount of available total habitat. So for thinking of cover and space, we also want to think about the range for these species. So for example, here I have pictured the Carolina wren. Um, they make these cute little nests and um, I actually had one in my carport one year. So they will nest, they are very compatible with the urban environment and they'll nest right in, um, you know, with an urban space as long as they have, they actually predominantly feed on insects. And so as long as they have that insect food base, they'll range throughout, you can see down into Mexico, up into almost Maine, um, in New England there, Rhode Island and everything. And we have them throughout Florida. So this is something that you can actually actively work on attracting by, by working on those pollinator uh, gardens. So you have not only uh, space for them, but cover for them to do their nesting. And um, thankfully in the carport, it wasn't in the house, it was in a little bookcase. So um, I felt like that was acceptable for them to not make too much of a mess. And uh, it did feel like having a temporary roommate for a little while. So, you know, you have to kind of pick the ones that you wanna foster, but thinking about how does the structure of the plant and landscape help this species? Um, so, you know, again, they might not directly nectar like a hummingbird or even eat the, the seeds or the berries of my mulberry tree or anything, but they are going to really prey on the insects of my pollinator plants. Um, thinking about the size of the cover, so how tall will it naturally grow? Again, we want low maintenance, so we don't want to be coming in and pruning back uh, five times a year, 12 times a year. Um, you know, so we want to think about how tall will that species grow, mature spread, and again, our Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection, which Tia did put in the chat, thank you, Tia, um, does tell us the maximum growth of many Florida Friendly plants, which include native species. So check out that free guide in the link, and we'll email it to you later so that you can use that and download it and print it if you'd like. Uh, to actually figure out what the height and spread of these species are, looking at, you know, how tall it'll be, how short, how much, you know, how will it be when it's mature? You know, is it a shrub? Is it a small tree? Various aspects. <coughs> Excuse me, foliage density. Some plants naturally have lots of leaves, lots of cover. Others might be more sparse or others might have, like we talked about with the caterpillar, a life history that they're going to be pretty much eaten down by their caterpillars. So thinking about, you know, throughout the season, is it a deciduous plant? Is it a dense foliage plant? Where can the wildlife hide? You know, are there thorns? So thorns might be perfectly acceptable for our songbirds, but small mammals like a possum might not be able to utilize those trees. 
Some birds want to perch and be seen. So Tia mentioned the, the birds of prey. And then again, the deciduousness of a tree, which means that in the winter time, it's dropping those leaves. And so it's not gonna really provide that year round evergreen foliage that some species might need. And the branching structure, the best nesting trees are those with a great diversity in branch sizes and branch forks. Um, so thinking about shrubs, really, a lot of our shrub species. And you might be growing something that you think, well, you know, I'm growing this because I think it's pretty or, um, you know, I want to harvest the X, Y, Z. And then you notice it actually makes a really good nesting or shrub cover. So one example of that is our pigeon peas. Um, or gandules, we have the um, kind of Caribbean pigeon pea, which is an edible legume. And I've noticed that birds just love those to hide in. Uh, they don't really eat the pea pods, but they do like to perch. And um, I have one growing right next to my bird bath. And, you know, I was growing it for the legumes to harvest, but there you go. It's great for those birds as well. And Tia mentioned, our nesting uh, cavity dwelling birds. So um, we have our birds of prey, we have the owl, we have the woodpeckers and other animals that like cavities and dwell in cavities. These are gonna be from our snags. These are really important. So using dead trees, as long as it's not a threat to you know, life and property, um, you know, obviously if it's right next to your car or your house, it might have to go, turn it into mulch. Uh, but if it's, you know, along the lake shore or farther away on your property, definitely consider leaving it because these are really great, not only for these cavity dwelling birds, but also our insects. And a lot of insects will start to kind of hollow these out and, and really um, utilize that as, as habitat. We've done a lot of work with invasive species. Of course, last month we had our weed wrangle encouraging people to get out and remove the invasive species from your yard. Um, an invasive species is a, a non-native species that int its introduction does or is likely to cause economic environmental harm or harm to human health. And so, you know, you can see here a few of our big ones, the wild taro, be sure you're not growing any of these, the Brazilian pepper, lantana, air potato, you know, we all know these big bad ones. There are a lot of invasive species that actually, um, you know, you can still kind of buy at the big box store. And we want to just be careful as we're, um, you know, thinking about habitat, not to select these species, but also to, if you have them blowing into your yard and taking root, make sure you try to target and remove them. For wildlife and natives, um, we, we look at butterfly gardens. We want to put these in full sun uh, with windbreak and, you know, so that it's shading the wind. Um, they may require supplemental irrigation. So, you know, we don't want things that are wilting, but if you're, if you're picking native species, once they're established, it's probably going to be able to taper off. If you have some of your more succulent horticultural type species, you might need to supplement that irrigation and maybe provide a puddle pond for drinking for these, um, for these butterflies. So butterflies actually drink, they don't drink from something like a bird bath. They actually drink from moist soil. So the soil has to be really well saturated. And so if you have a little dish or a plate that you can put some soil into and keep it nice and moist um, and, you know, really monitoring it to, to watch for mosquitoes as well as we move into the rainy season. Uh, but that's a great play. That's, that's how they get their water. And so, you know, when we want to have a pollinator garden, we also need to make sure that they can make it their drink and um, nectar as well. Wildlife and natives. So thinking again about butterfly gardens, having that host plant and allowing the food and the foliage for those caterpillars. A larvae will consume its body weight in host plant material every two days. So if you think about how many um, plants you're gonna have, you wanna think about you know, how many pollinators are you willing to support and the nectar aspect of that. So providing a color, shape, size, and bloom variety. So some things will be 
more likely to flower in the fall or maybe the spring and thinking about that. So water sources, you know, these could be natural lakes, retention ponds, or even bird baths. Maybe you have a little backyard pond that the animal can drink from. Of course, we need to check with the HOA, county, city, Department of Environment to make sure that we're working with any regulations that might be in place. But um, once we move past that, we can have varying depths to increase that habitat of making sure they have water. This can be used by frogs, toads, salamanders, water snakes, turtles, birds, mammals. You know, everybody needs water. So this is gonna be a great way to attract wildlife. Uh, brightly colored fish can be vulnerable to predators. So if you're thinking koi pond, I might change that to guppy pond um, or our little Florida mollies are a great selection and can be quite beautiful and dazzling. Um, and they're just tiny and they eat mosquito larvae. So you definitely wanna add those in, but koi might not be a good selection because raccoons could come and, and um, take a lunch real quick. Um, shelters, so brush piles, you know, Tia mentioned mulch and other little twigs can really create some habitat. Nesting boxes pictured here on the bottom right. Um, these are really for, again, our cavity dwellers. If we don't have a snag or a tree that is hollowing out and perfect for them, we can add a nest box, which simulates that, that feeling for them. Bird feeders, so bird feeders are a great addition. You can see here on the right, our little tufted tit mouse, um, a beautiful little uh, native bird species that likes to eat seeds. Location, you wanna do one that's good for you. So um, actually for, you know, looking out your window that you can see them and you can, you know, enjoy them and access it easily to clean it because once that feeder gets any kind of mold in there, they won't come. So you wanna make sure you're keeping it clean and it's accessible close to cover. So, you know, under a big oak tree or next to a nice shrub because, you know, they're darting around, they can get caught up by a big bird of prey. Um, you know, other animals, snakes will come after them. So even cats, we wanna make sure that we're providing that cover away from foot traffic. We want to have the shape and perch uh, so that they can come and actually perch while they're feeding. Of course, hummingbirds don't need that. And then, of course, the food that you put in there is going to depend on the species. And so different bird blends of bird seed and bird food will attract different types of animals and, and birds. With the feeders, again, you want to clean it at least once a month to get rid of any fungus or disease. Also, another really important point is to not put them in the irrigation range. So I made that mistake when I first put it up, um, you know, a couple years ago and I came home and, you know, it was like, okay, this is very wet. We need to fix this. But you can easily adjust your irrigation, make sure that it's out of the range um, and place the feeders away from an area that cats can find them as well. So we also recommend keeping those cats indoors. Wild cats, feral cats, or even just indoor outdoor cats can cause a lot of harm to our native bird population. And then bird seed and bird feeders with squirrels. You know, maybe it drives you crazy or maybe you just say, hey, the squirrels just grabbing a quick bite too. Um, with me, you know, if it's a full on shakedown, then Maybe we want to reevaluate it, but it seems like our squirrels are fairly well fed and they just come and, and take a little bit and the birds get a fair amount as well. So kind of watch it and see how you feel about it. Expand the scale of your habitat. So this is really where it comes into play of educating your neighbors, your HOA and your you know, coworkers and other people about this really important task that we want to create you know, more habitat within our area. So we don't want to, you know, just have one little parcel, even though that little parcel is great for pollinators, but if we're trying to support something like a hawk, um, you know, it's going to be different than, say, a Carolina wren. So here on the top, you can see 
the hawk is going to need several neighborhoods, several conservation areas to do its full range of, um, you know, reproduction, forage, all that. Or a Carolina wren, again, one can nest in my carport, another one can nest in the backyard of my neighbor, and they're perfectly happy in just a small tract of land. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tia to talk a little bit about cultural practices, or you might have uh, heard us talk about best management practices as well. Yeah, we're gonna start wrapping it up here and kind of these are your basic Florida friendly practices, no matter what you're doing with your yard, if you're creating a habitat for wildlife or butterflies or hummingbirds, you need to be mindful of your chemical use and how you're mowing and watering and, you know, managing your pets. So let me see if I can change the slide here. Yes, you should have control. Oh, did I go too far? Uh oh, you're gone. Okay, let me take it uh, back. Yes, please. Sorry about that technical difficulty. It's all right. There's a delay with that, so I can just forward for you. Okay, sure. All right, so next slide. All right, so when we have wildlife and we're trying to create life in our garden, we don't want to kill that. And so what you need to be mindful is your insecticide use, also other chemicals like herbicides, um, pesticides. So be mindful that most pesticides won't just kill one species. A lot of them are kind of broad spectrum. You know, they will kill a lot of different species um, think of something even like neem oil, which is an organic pesticide, you know, it kills any kind of soft bodied insect. So we don't want to be spraying that, you know, on plants we're trying to attract caterpillars and butterflies to. Um, you want to use targeted pesticides that if you do have a specific problem, you know, spray it right there, identify the problem and only target it on the area that is the problem area and not kind of blanket spray everything. And what that will do if you do over spray or spray too much, it will ruin your insect food base. So when we talk about um, planting insectary plants and creating an ecological landscape where the good bugs are preying on the bad bugs, um, you don't want to kill all the bugs because that will, you know, mess up the e ecology in your landscape. So what you want to do is you want to allow a little bit of the bad bugs, like the aphids, allow them to live because that provides food for their pests, I mean, their um, predators, like ladybugs. And many of these insects are pollinators too. So they're there, they're eating the bugs, they're, you know, touching your flowers, getting a little pollen on them, hopping to the next flower, do that too. And really less than 1% of insects are considered pests. So just because you see a bug doesn't mean it's a bad bug. If you need help identifying it, then you can send it to us or your local extension agent in your county and they can help you identify it. And we also have resources with the entomologists up at the University of Florida if we're not able to identify it. Um, again, just spot tree, you know, for the target area or use specific baits for your pest problem. And just do not spray indiscriminately or broadcast spray everything. Remember that the pests will return faster than the predators. Um, so you want to keep that balance in your yard and really judiciously use insecticide. If you need some help with um, what to spray or what, um, then feel free to contact us. And we always recommend the least toxic spray first, you know, starting with organic or natural sprays. And if that doesn't um, remedy your problem, then use something more toxic. Next slide. Yeah, that's a really good one. And we, we talk a lot about that with our homeowners associations that, you know, we don't really want to be contracting to do that routine pesticide application. We want to 
identify what the insect is and then kind of say, good bug, bad bug, you know, let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a big decision making process that we teach in the integrated pest management, the IPM. So next I'm going to talk about the lawn and one thing that you can do to attract more wildlife to your yard is to reduce the lawn area. Now I'm not saying that turf grass is bad. Um, turf grass can also be Florida friendly. It does provide greenery. It has nice roots that help to you know, hold the soil in place and filter out nutrients and prevent soil erosion. But it just offers very little food and cover for wildlife. So if you have a yard like the one pictured on the left, it's just a fence and a lawn, not a lot of food or, you know, vertical layering of plants for the wildlife to hide. And so not too many things will come to your yard. Um, what you can work towards is something more like the picture on the right where you have some little flowers and they can still be in a manicured look, you know, around the fence line, uh, maybe plant some trees. Trees are very important for giving that perch for the birds. And you can even, you know, leave some of your yard unmowed, especially right now in our spring season. We have all these beautiful wildflowers coming up. There's like the lyre leaf sage with the purple flowers. There's the native um, dog fleabane with the little white daisy flowers. And if you just hold off on mowing a little bit longer, then you can let the bees and the butterflies and the insects enjoy all those flowers and then, and then go ahead and mow it so you can have that nice manicured look. Next. So another thing you need to consider is the watering. So follow your local water restrictions. Um, if you're in Seminole County, you'll be looking at the St. John's Water Management District. But if you're in other counties, um, look for the regulations of the water management district in your area that are often given to you by your utility um, company. So here um, we recommend that you water before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. You don't want to water in the heat of the day because the water will be lost to transpiration, I mean evaporation going up into the air. We also don't want to water too much at night because that can um, leave the soil and the plants wet and create a good habitat for fungal pathogens to grow. So um, we want to get the watering just right. Too much water will create fungal issues. It could be root rot. You might see your plants, even though they have too much water, are still wilting. And that's an indication of a fungal problem. Also, the leaves may be browning. Um, you can actually let your plants go kind of dry and look for signs of water stress in your lawn. And that's where your lawn blade will kind of start to curl up and like close up. And that's how you know, okay, my lawn is getting dry now and it will be fine like that. And then you can irrigate it as needed. So um, we just got a little rain yesterday, so we should be good. But especially right now in the springtime, watch your watering, follow the um, regulations and water in the morning. So manage pests is the last thing I'm gonna talk about here. So cats can be really devastating to our wildlife. In a 2013 study, it's estimated that free ranging domestic cats kill between one and four billion birds per year. Billion, I'm talking here. And six to 22 billion mammals, like small little animals. And so they can really be devastating to the wildlife. Um, do not encourage strays in your yard. Don't feed them. Don't encourage them to live in your yard. Um, keep your pets, your cats indoors or screened in. And there's a product, the Cat Bib, and that works to stop 81% um, of cats from catching birds. So we don't want the cats to eat the birds. 
Um, so keep your cats under control, make sure they're not doing too much harm for the wildlife and be careful of other pets, like other exotic pets, like your snakes. And I heard somebody had a big iguana <laughs> living under their house. So keep those in their cages, in their house. They don't belong in our environment in Florida. And like the Python, they could kind of be released and multiply like crazy and then be wreaking havoc on our environment. So just be mindful of that when you're taking care of your wildlife ha habitat. Yeah, the cat bib is really cool. If you are, you know, really want to have your cat outside, I definitely recommend buying one. Um, they are research based that they do work. Um, it's basically a little bib that the cat when they go to attack, it'll just kind of prevent them from actually being able to kill everything. Um, it'll, I think it reduces it by 80%. Yeah. So 81%. Uh, so definitely a worthy investment, but, you know, also consider that indoor cats live a lot longer. And so, you know, a lot of our cats that are allowed outside do get hit by cars in urban areas, um, and, you know, might eat stuff that can poison them. And so indoor cats live a lot longer. So love your pet by keeping them inside. And now I'm gonna to transition to talk about nuisance animals. So we're gonna kind of briefly gloss over snakes, alligators, moles, armadillos, deer, and bear. So when we're trying to attract wildlife, which is the Florida friendly principle, you know, a lot of the times we think about butterflies, bees, birds, you know, but we might get other animals. And, you know, a lot of the times the first go-to is fear, know, get rid of them. They're going to, you know, invade my attic, um, just really kind of just pushing them out. And so we want to reassess, okay, let's start with identifying that wildlife, um, figuring out what it is, you know, so looking for scat, which is poop, um, animal poop, and looking at the scat will tell you what kind of animal it is. So here on the left, this is deer poop. Um, we have little tiny pellets. It could also be bunny if it was smaller, um, but little pellets usually are going to be either bunnies if they're really small or if they're a little bigger, going to be deer. Um, down here on the left, this is some kind of carnivore. We can see fur in there. It might be a bobcat. It might be a coyote. Um, it probably is some kind of a, a smaller cat because it's not as big as coyote. And it might sound silly, but this is going to help you look for evidence of animals, um, you know, looking at the tracks, looking at what kind of animal might be kind of passing through your property. We want to look at soil disturbance. So not only tracks, but you might see a burrow, a type of hole in the earth. So here you can see this is an armadillo hole. It actually is more circular than say the crescent moon or half moon of the gopher tortoise. So gopher tortoises are typically gonna have that half moon shape and they're gonna have a wide, what we call skirt. So this is gonna be called the skirt of the burrow and the skirt is gonna be very active. Um, recently, um, you know, active burrows are gonna have a lot of soil, fresh soil dug up where again, the skirt of the burrow for the armadillo is a little bit more linear and straight and then we have pocket gophers here on the on the top right, little pocket gophers. And then on the bottom, this is a mole where the soil is actually raised just a little bit and it looks like a line going through the soil. That's gonna be moles on the bottom right. Talking a little bit about snakes. So Florida has 39 native sna snake species that are uh, totally harmless, non-venomous. So they're, they can be secretive and rarely seen by people. So again, the bulk of our species in Florida are non-venomous and will not hurt you at all. The risk of venomous snakes is extremely small, so we want to leave it be. We will, if we see a snake, we just want to assume that um, you know it's doing its thing, it's preying on you know rodents or maybe providing prey for our birds of prey because they do eat snakes and we wanna leave them be. Um, they're at risk of being killed by pets. So cats will eat you know, or kill 
uh, snakes, of course, lawnmowers, vehicles, residents. Um, I know one time when I was gardening, I accidentally kill, or yeah, it was pretty much killed, uh, a blind snake, which is a type of uh, lizard, skink type of um, animal because I wasn't paying attention, you know, and it was causing no harm to me. I just was hoeing with my hoe and then there it was. And, you know, I felt so bad, but they are at risk for, you know, getting killed by lawnmowers and such. So we want to just be conscious when we're out there and, you know, allow snakes to be present. Typically in the home landscape, what you're going to get is that garden snake. Um, it's just a small black racer snake and it has a little white under its neck. And so you'll see it. It's not going to cause any harm to you. It's going to eat those bad um, rodents. And so we want them in our yard. Alligators. So alligators are present in aquatic and wet areas. Never feed alligators. Not only is it bad, but it's illegal. Um, do not swim where alligators are present and definitely keep children and pets away from the water's edge. Gators are select prey, not um, by size, not species. So if the, the animal, if the, the gator is a small gator, they might eat little fish, they might eat little turtles, but as they get bigger, they're gonna select maybe a blue heron, maybe large birds, ducks, things like that. So um, they're kind of opportunistic as they age. And so little teeny tiny baby gators are gonna be eating little type of fish. Um, if you do have a bad altercation with a gator, you wanna call FWC immediately. But again, it is a respect thing. So we wanna you know, be mindful of these gators and um, you know, just kind of treat them with respect, observe them from afar, do not harass them. A lot of the times when we see altercations in the news, it's because somebody was, you know, having an altercation with the species, um, getting too close, getting close to a mother with a nest or something like that. Moles, these are gonna be one, again, similar to the snake where it's perfectly acceptable to have these in your yard. We get a lot of questions about moles. You know, what can I do about the moles? They're tearing up my yard. But a lot of the times moles are kind of in and out seasonally. So you might get uh, some activity in the spring or fall where they're kind of doing little tunnels. But a lot of the times you can easily just kind of use your foot to pad over those tunnels. The mole will find somewhere else to go. They're feeding on grubs, mole crickets, which what do we treat for? When we treat turf, we treat for mole crickets. Um, so the moles are eating the mole crickets, which are bad for your turf. So moles are actually a good thing. Um, they're eating other soil pests. Uh, they're not leaving lasting damage to the lawn. In fact, one thing that we would pay a landscaper to do would be aeration. Moles actually aerate your soil to be able to um, have more root growth. So the mole will come through, leave a nice little hole, and the roots will fill in and um, the plants will be happier. So moles actually can help aerate your soil. And again, they're not going to be sticking around. They're going to be passing through, um, again, using your yard as a corridor. You want to scout and press that soil back into place and, um, you know, just go about your day. They're not going to be a threat. Armadillos. Armadillos like sandy or loam soils to excavate a deep burrow. It's probably unlikely they will build a, a, a burrow on your property unless you do have a significant amount of space. They're going to feed on insects at night. So they are a nocturnal animal, just like our owls and our other um, you know, nocturnal animal species that are active at night, feeding on insects. So since they're a night animal, they have very poor sight and hearing. They rely on their sense of smell and their little hands to really feel and touch through the soil. They have high mortality along highways. That's why we do see them perish as roadkill frequently. And they may dig holes in your lawn. So, um, but again, those can be easily filled back in. These are no threat to you. Um, armadillos are usually going to be moving through because one yard, uh, they're going to need several yards to, to exist. And so they're going to be moving through. Deer. 
Um, again, you know, if you're trying to grow a vegetable garden, I do feel for you because deer can be a challenge with that. But we want to put in, um, think about using a deer fence to protect from them and then have other plants that, you know, maybe plant an extra hibiscus or something that allows them to forage. They can quickly multiply. And so again, when we think about our food web, these are going to be um, perished by cars, so automobile accidents, um, coyotes can eat deer, alligators can eat deer, bears. Um, so if we don't have those large car um, carnivores or top predators, then the deer population tends to explode and we're seeing a lot of deer. So that's why having those large carnivores, those large top predators are important to keep that food web in balance. Anyhow, um, you know, they do like habitat where it's on the cusp of the forest. So if you're in our Wakaiva Basin or in a more rural area, you might see more deer or, you know, subdivisions that are adjacent to the areas. Again, your ornamental plants, your vegetables, some of them can persist. So like Sue was saying about her firebush, they might eat the lower leaves, but the, the plant's still able to persist no problem. Um, you can use scare tactics, repellents, or uh, fencing. Really, fencing is going to be your best bet for your vegetable gardens. And again, for your ornamentals, just monitor them and make sure that they're not able to chew down the whole thing, you know, and, and that the plant won't be able to bounce back. And, you know, changing the food source. So thinking about having, a, again, a diversity of ornamentals and plants. Bears. Bears use a wide range. Specifically, male bears will range for miles and miles to mate, um, to search for food, to find dens, and things like that. So male bears, specifically female bears as well, they have a wide range for habitat. They do suffer significantly from habitat loss and fragmentation they do have a diet that's mostly plants. So we're talking 80% foraging on saw palmetto berries, um, other berries, you know, raspberry, or sorry, blackberries and mulberries, other types of uh, plant material. They actually will eat cabbage palm hearts and other, you know, plants. And then they do, of course, hunt these small mammals and other things. They're opportunistic and generalistic. So we want to be sure that we're using those bear safe containers and garbage, um, keeping our pet food secure and not putting it outside. And again, if you're in a bear zone, do not use bird feeders. Secure those food sources. If you do have a bear encounter, you know, keep calm, do not run, give the bear space to retreat, make noise, really just clapping your hands is usually enough to scare the bear away. It's when we have those bears that start to rely on garbage and human refuse, um, you know, these other types of food sources that they lose their fear. So we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, securing food, you know, any type of food source. If you're into composting in a bare area, be sure that that composter is bear proof, maybe one of the tumblers or something like that so that they're not attracted in. Um, here's a picture for Seminole County for our County, uh, Seminole County people. This is the Bear Ordinance area. So you can see it's along um, brushing up to the Wakaiva River and the Wakaiva Basin area. So including that west of I-4 area. And then closing out with coyotes. So coyotes are a fairly new predator to Florida, but they're found in every single county. So they have rapidly adapted to our urban matrix and our rural matrix. They're in the dog family. They're brown to gray to black, and they usually weigh about 25 to 30 pounds. They are omnivores, meaning they do eat um, plant material along with animals. They're opportunistic, and they protect, uh, or sorry, uh, prey. This should be prey on cats, dogs, hmm, small domestic species, and they can be a threat to children. So. You know, this is something to be mindful of. Um, again, securing the area with, um, you know, securing your trash and things like that, um, talking with neighbors and, you know, just being mindful that they are out. 
So with that, I'm excited to turn to questions. You can see my contact information here. Um, for Tia, I recommend you check out her Facebook. It's Garden Florida on Facebook. So you can follow her and, oops, excuse me. Um, and just to tell you about a few events that we do have upcoming, you can use your smartphone camera. Everybody pull out your smartphone and uh, check out if you can make it Wednesday, the 24th. This Wednesday at 2 p.m. on Facebook, we'll be having a talk. I'll be on Water Wednesdays talking about the power of your pond. Uh, so we're talking about your stormwater pond or your backyard pond or your lake, um, any kind of waterfront. So use your QR code to register now. We also have Tia's butterfly gardening class coming up. Again, another QR code chance to register right there. I'll also put these in the follow-up email if you'd like to register. We can register through Eventbrite for this one. And it's March 30th at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So if you're interested in particularly butterfly gardening, which we covered a little bit today, join us using your smartphone camera to register right now. And then just a heads up, no registration available yet. But for anybody who lives in Sanford, um, you can get free stuff for Earth Week. So we're going to have Monday the 19th through Thursday, April 22nd. We're going to have a free giveaways for those of you that join us online for webinars. And so we'll have classes uh, Monday through Thursday with pickup and free trees, rain barrels, shower cup giveaways, all kinds of things. We're partnering with the city of Sanford to give away stuff on Thursday the 24th. That's a Saturday morning. So um, keep an eye out for that. I'll be sending information through our Facebook and our newsletter. Yeah, a lot of good things coming up. And we do have a few questions. I will read them off to you, Tina, starting in the Q&A. So this question is from Marty Anderson. What are examples of plants in the mint family that are good to plant in 9B hardwood part sun yards? I love um, brown, I think it's called brownies savory or St. John's mint. Um, that's one that I include in my plants for wet areas class. And um, it's thought to be a native, but again, it's one of those that it's a little bit debated, but it does grow in our St. John's River Basin. And it is a wonderful mint, true to the, the mint, you know, menthol uh, taste. And it grows like a really well ground cover. So that's brownie savory or um, also known as St. John's mint. All right, okay. <laughs> Um, next question from Leslie. I'm in South Dade. We have lots of monarchs, so I'm always trying to keep sufficient larval food, but I don't think that milkweed is native. Mm, yes. So I'm really glad you asked that, Leslie, because we have the tropical milkweed. And so a lot of us who have cultivated a butterfly garden or, you know, anything like that might have the tropical milkweed. It's really good at reseeding and it's perfectly acceptable to grow, especially in South Florida. The thing about it is in Central Florida or in North Florida, we really do want to cut it back when it gets cold. So thinking about November, December, January, February, taking it all the way down to the ground and don't let it bloom because uh, we have our monarchs are migratory. And so they're making their way down to Mexico and we wanna allow them to do that migration. And when we allow them the milkweed to bloom throughout the cold season, they can, if it's a cold winter perish, um, they won't get that signaling to, to follow the food, follow the flowers. So we want to cut that tropical milkweed back in North and Central Florida. South Florida, I believe it's acceptable to let it bloom year round because it is a tropical environment down there. So check your zone um, and definitely check your species of milkweed and just follow the best management practices. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, some other questions along that vein. Um, here's a different question from Linda. I have a large amount of brackish water. 
um, kind of moving water on the property, do wildlife use this water source for drinking? So do the wildlife drink the brackish water? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so brackish water, I'm assuming is you're referring to a salty mix, usually in our estuary type areas, Indian River, you know, uh, bays throughout, throughout Florida. That's what we refer to as brackish water. Black water is also black or brown um, up north in the Suwannee River. That's more uh, tinted from our tannins and tinted from the, uh, you know, the, the oak trees and things like that. So if we're not talking about blackish water, which is um, black water is fresh water. It's actually no saline. Brackish water is usually brown, um, but it's usually mixed with the salt water from the ocean. So it's not fully saline like our salt water, our ocean, but it is a mix. And so um, it depends. Some animals can, um, you know, like osprey, they're not going to be bothered too much by brackish waters. Others, you know, like your monarchs and things like that, they probably won't benefit too much from that salty brackish water. So um, you know, it just depends. I think if you're in an estuary type environment, a lot of those animals are going to be aware of the difference um, in, in water sources. And so they're going to be able to kind of distinguish, okay, this is salty water. You know, animals do need fresh water to drink. And the thing about brackish water too is it changes. So in the rainy season, our brackish water is fed by fresh rainwater. In the dry season right now, we don't have as much fresh rainwater flushing off of the land. And so our ocean water starts to come in and it becomes more salty. And so that affects you know, our oysters, our wildlife and everything. And so you know, really, there's probably not much you can do about it um, if it's flowing over your property. And so really, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but just know that animals do need fresh water for drinking. Yeah, good answer. I would say the same. So here's a quick question from Victoria. Will there be a plant sale at the Seminole Extension Building this year? Yeah, probably not. We had to do our virtual expo last month. So um, not this year. Uh, we are hoping, you know, we did it virtual, so we'll pick it up next year and uh, go from there. Okay, next question about um, kind of butterfly gardening. So do you have suggestions for best plants for butterfly garden starters? Um, I do one host, like host to nectar ratio. Like what is the correct formula um, like for the plants? And that's from George. Yeah, so if you're just getting started, one really cool thing that's kind of popping up right now is container butterfly gardening. And so you do one larger container with several different um, species and you have your host, um, you have your nectar and just getting started with that, you know, because kind of clearing a whole area and doing it all at once, like Pia said, it can be, it can be challenging and, and we don't wanna get frustrated and burnt out. We wanna have wins and successes that keep us going. So starting off with a nice little container garden, um, you know, that's got good soil and beautiful plants and, you know, starting with that, seeing the results, seeing the crystallis, um, seeing the pollinators, the butterflies, and, and the caterpillars, you know, is really where we want to go with that. So I recommend starting off real small with a nice diversity container. Yeah, and like everyone does the milkweed, and then you have your zinnias, and cosmos, and there's so many great butterfly plants out there, salvias, all the salvias are good, the native, the non-native, um, couple people mentioned the porter weed, native and non-native, those are all great plants. Yeah, and if you have a little space, um, our aster fa family has the flowers that, like a sunflower, um, but smaller, you know, that they have a lot of flowers in one flower. So each individual um, little part of that flower is actually one flower. 
So those are kind of a lot of bang for your buck. And that would be things like any kind of sunflower type family. So your Rudbeckias, uh, Black Eyed Susans, those are good because one little cone, cone flower has many different nectar sources for them. So just something to consider if you're starting out. Yeah, a little, little bit of everything. So next question from Leslie. I have some native porterweed, but it does not seem to attract the butterflies. It does not bloom significantly. Maybe I need more of it. What's your advice for the native porterweed, Tina? Hmm. I would do a, honestly, I would check pH and soil on that one because usually the native porterweed is quick to establish and, um, you know, it, it does bloom um, in sun and shade. So it wouldn't be a sun thing. Um, I would kind of check with the soil situation if you're having trouble establishing that native porter weed. Is it um, maybe a wet thing as well? I think they can take a little water, but they're not going to like it super wet. So yeah. <laughs> are kind of dormant right now too. Like they kind of declined a little bit in the winter and then they'll be popping and flowering more, you know, in the next couple months. So yeah, could maybe be give it some dieback. time. Yeah. Or plant more in a cluster, like instead of just having one plant, like 10 together in a massing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Good luck. Life. Okay, here's, here's a question for slugs from Bobby, slugs are killing my hostas. I ordered Steiner Nima Carpocopsi, the SC, beneficial nematodes. This is planned for a very small raised bed area attached to my home. I have shells, I'm assuming eggshells, around the hostas, but that is not discouraging the slugs. Mm. Any other suggestions in your opinion about the nematodes? Thank you so much for the wonderful info, Bobby. Actually, I think maybe um, she means shells. Like um, a lot of the times people use shells instead of oh, yeah. mold. Like oyster shells. Yeah, and so um, I might switch to a mulch situation because the shells could be providing a good kind of habitat for those slugs and we want to enhance the organic material. So maybe, um, I don't, I don't know, I'm, because you probably don't want to get rid of your shells, but maybe blending in some mulch into that area could actually help. And, you know, a lot of the times with the slugs, they will be seasonal. So you'll see them with the spring and then, you know, birds are going to start eating them and they're gonna kind of flush out. So again, some of these things can be seasonal and that's okay. Um, one other thing before I do see some people signing off is that we're gonna have a survey. So we really need you to complete the survey. We're gonna be sending it later today to your email. We'll send you a few reminders, um, but over the next week, we would really love it if you could complete that survey. It'll take just a couple minutes and let us know if you learned something today and if you intend to pick up one of our um, you know, recommendations or, or things like that. So stay tuned for our email, stay tuned for our survey, you'll get it today. And then actually I'm gonna check back with you in three to six months and see if you've been able to increase your habitat and done any Florida friendly behavior changes. So definitely um, fill out the survey today that you get and then when you hear from me in three to six months, it's a different survey to see if you've been able to integrate anything. So please, the class is free, but we do ask you to pay us in completing our survey. Yeah, that's really important to our bosses. Yeah, well, uh, one more thing about the slugs. Often the slugs like cold, damp, shady areas. So you might just have one of those kind of bad spots for plants and and hostas are good for full shade. They're not particularly known to do that well in Florida, but um, it might be just a difficult environment that has a lot of pests. And so maybe planting something more, you know, bulletproof for the shade or, um, you know, making sure you cut back on the water or try to dry it out somehow for the slug problem. Yeah, that's a great point. Shade, you know, we really recommend watering less. 
shady environments are low maintenance environments, meaning less water, less fertilizing, you know, less uh, pruning because they're not growing as much. There's not as much sun to drive that photosynthesis. So we really want to make sure that we're managing them in that way. And I think, you know, pulling back on that stuff could help with the slugs as well. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Phyllis. What about coastal habitat? Any specific recommendations? I'm not sure if she's asking for plants or maintenance for coastal habitats. Yeah, so um, we didn't really cover that today because, uh, you know, we're in the central Florida, but yeah, for coastal habitats, it's pretty similar. You're just going to want to select from the plant selection guide and make sure that um, you're picking things that are salt tolerant. So that's the biggest thing. I mean, most plants can tolerate a little bit of salt. Um, but if you're really on the coast and you are on a barrier island, you definitely want to be picking things that are um, salt tolerant, salt resilient, and, um, and that type of thing. And just replicating the dune system. So dune sunflower, galardia, um, sea grapes, you know, a lot of those great coastal plants. Yeah, good suggestions. So, um... Next question. For Highlands County, we have a cleared lake lot, but I believe it is the scrub area near Lake June State Scrub Park. But there was an orange grove prior and being developed into a residential area. So we're not building yet and we need to plant some type of cover crop. My hubby wants a lawn. I want to create habitat. Any ideas? I think you can have both. What do you think, Tina? Absolutely. Yeah, we want to come to a happy medium between the household, like talk and converse and come to an agreement. Talk with your HOA if you're in that, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's on board with what we're doing. Um, and you can have both, you know, when you're thinking about planning your landscape, you want to have an area for the dog, an area for the grandkids or the kids. Um, you know, you want to have an area for the, the habitat, you know, so you can absolutely do both. Um, there's a lot of great ground covers. I was just noticing that my twin flower, which is a Florida native, great ground cover. My daughter can play around in it, but it's also going to be great for our little insects. So there's some plants that check all boxes and then um, areas you might just need to dedicate, you know, this is our turf, you know, this is our area where we're going to play frisbee and walk the dog. This is our area where we're going to have our vegetation. And that's okay. We want to make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then um, I did see an interesting one here, T. I just wanted to get your thought. Is there a flowering tree or flowering bush that will tolerate wet feet? Oh, yeah, I'm an expert in wet feet. So um, the elderberry, which we showed, that has the flowers and then the fruit for the birds. The, the fire bush also likes wet. Um, gingers, um, they can take shady, wet, um, rich soil. And when you let them flower, I've seen hummingbirds on some of the types of gingers. So that's a good one. Um, let me I'm see what else. Button bush. Oh yeah, button bush. I was, what, I first I was thinking elderberry. So we're on the same wavelength. I love elderberries. They're great. The, the umble flowers are perfect, followed by those berries. I mean, they're just great for everyone. Um, and then yeah, button bush is great too. Likes it real wet and have cool spherical kind of alien shaped flowers. So those are fun. Yeah, mulberries can take it kind of wet too. Yeah, mulberries, yep. For sure. Yeah. And even, um, you know, lakeside, our pickerel weed is a great pollinator flower, you know, lots of swallowtails and all kinds of uh, pollinators love those. So those are really fun too, if it's really wet. Yeah. If you're like in the water. Mm -hmm. And then there's that Carolina aster, which is kind of a shrubby, a large shrubby with the pretty purple flowers. Yeah. And then I see here, what are the black and orange grasshoppers that are coming out of the ground? They That's eat my plants. How do I get rid of them? 
I'm going to guess those are lubber grasshoppers. What do you think, Tia? Yeah, that was my guess too, the Eastern lubber grasshopper. And they look Chinese to me, but they're actually like native. Yeah, they're totally native. And, um, you know, it really depends. So I don't mind them. Um, I don't have a lot of plants that they tend to chew down on. Um, usually you'll see... Uh, I guess in the summertime, it depends on where you are in, in Florida because we're kind of, our seasons are slightly different, but um, you know, usually in spring, summer, you'll see actually a cluster of small black lubber grasshoppers. So when they're, they're juveniles, they're black with a little orange streak and um, you'll see a cluster of them because they, you know, they kind of uh, all were laid together. And then as they mature, you'll still see a few, but they start to kind of disperse to your neighbor's yards and such. And they do like a lot of our ornamental fleshy plants. So they like bromeliads, they like amaryllis, um, things like that. But I noticed, you know, um, you know, they really will just take bites and they won't destroy the plant. And so, you know, especially with our bromeliads, those are hardy, they can take some chewing. And, um, you know, I really don't mind the lovers. They will eat some of the mulberries and, but I plant enough for everyone. And, you know, I really don't mind them, but my colleague, Katie McCormick, our other agent, you know, she does not like them. And so it just really depends, you know, for me, I think they're, they're prey for our uh, birds and things like that. We'll pick them off and I've noticed they're not too much of a problem. How about you, Tia? Do you let them hang out or? What do you do with them? Yeah, I mean, in the past, I've killed some because I thought they were exotic. But now that I know they're native, I don't really mess with them. And they don't do significant damage that they're, you know, eating my tomatoes or my green beans or my peaches or anything. So I just leave them be. Yeah, they tend to like, like if you have a lot of cultivated, fleshy, ornamental kind of non-native plants, um, you might have more damage than... Um, on the other type of plant. So anyhow, good question. Um, another one here. I'm seeing Tia crushed shells versus mulch. That's yeah. one we get a lot. So we could say rocks and mulch. Uh, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, one, um, usually the shells or rocks are, you know, more expensive than mulch, but Two, the mulch is organic. It's going to break down. It's going to, you know, provide organic matter and increase your organic matter in the soil. That helps to hold nutrients. It helps to hold water. Um, so we usually recommend mulch. The the crushed shells or rocks with the Florida sun, they can heat up the soil temperature, whereas the mulch cools it down. Um, but sometimes you might want some shells for like a pathway and that's better than just straight concrete or maybe alongside your house if you don't want anything organic touching your house that'd be good places for some rock or shell but don't do your whole landscape in rock or shell because that's not Florida friendly. Awesome yeah I totally agree definitely like mulch or, or pine straw uh, pine bark, our renewable mulches, uh, melaleuca mulch, those kinds of the things are great uh, as opposed to rocks or shells. Definitely recommend that because if you think about a natural forest ecosystem, we're trying to replicate that. Possibly if you're in a coastal system, those rocks and shells could be a little bit more, you know, desert, arid, like our coastal dune systems. Uh, but for the majority of Floridians, we want to go with a mulch. And yeah, uh, yeah. all those plants. Yeah, exactly. And then to close us out, I'm seeing one more question in the chat box, actually. Um, this person has a butterfly garden and they had a fruit tree recently that died. They're recommending uh, or they're asking for a recommendation for a tree replacement or shrub replacement for this area. I'm thinking maybe firebush or chase tree because those are great natives. Or sorry, well, the firebush is native. The chase tree is a Florida friendly and they're gonna be great complements pollinator um, to your pollinator garden. Yeah, good answer. 
Excellent. We also have the dwarf bottle brush at our extension center, and that's just a nice little compact and lots of bees on it all the time, flowering, low growing, evergreen. That's the dwarf bottle brush. Cool. Well, great. Well, with that, we're going to close it out, but thank you all so much for joining us today, sticking with us through the end. And remember, we will send that survey later today. Please take just a couple minutes to answer. It's just about five or 10 yes questions. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing you at a future uh, event. Thank you so much as well, Tia, for helping me and joining us today with your expertise. Yeah, I think everybody learned a lot and hopefully we'll see more wildlife in our yards here in Central Florida. Absolutely. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.